Um, I'm delighted with this opportunity to speak about defense and security as it relates to our region, our countries, and uh, what we have in common and, and what, what is different for, for our two countries. Um, the first thing to answer is why, why this book, why this publication, why bother with a book like this? Uh, it's a cool cover, but why bother doing this? Um, the answer is that we are witnessing a profound shift in the security landscape. Uh, one important element is that this shift um, is that Direction North has regained an urgency that we haven't seen for the last two or three decades. So consequently, we have to assess the new security environment uh, honestly and critically, without fear or favor, without bias. We must take the situation as it is, not as we wish it were, and we cannot afford to be intellectually lazy or complacent or naive about the new situation. And to get to the point for the northern region, Russia has re-emerged as the dominant factor for defense planning. This stands in, st in, in, in contrast to the last two decades where we have been preoccupied with operations in Afghanistan and Iraq with counterinsurgency operations. Um, but lately, Russia's rhetoric and behavior has caused a bit of concern. And in 2014, Russia illegally annexed Crimea and encouraged and sponsored separatist activity in eastern Ukraine. And this is not a thing of the past. They are still there. Russia's military actions has reshaped boundaries of a European state, and it is in violation of international law. However you define international law, it is a violation of it. And this is a confrontational stance that is not aligned to our Western values. So Moscow's significant number of forces on high readiness and reinvestment in high-end capabilities uh, and dual-use infrastructure along the Arctic coast adds urgency to that concern. The Kremlin started a big military modernization program in 2008 with emphasis on long-range precision weapons, and this presents a major distress to all of Europe, but for the northern countries and eastern uh, countries in particular. I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, bastion defense concept. Um, everybody who grew up in the Cold War uh, were aware of it. Um, as you see on the map, Russia needs what we call sea control of its inner bastion to defend its nuclear submarines outside the Kula Peninsula. They need to maneuver freely in the Barents Sea and protect their bases and forces on land. In terms of strategic depth, Russia needs sea denial to prevent others from operating freely down to the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap, what we call the Giuk gap. And of course, this relates particularly to Denmark with Greenland in the picture. The Russian armed forces fly more and they sail more than they did uh, a decade ago. Uh, the quality of the decision-making process has improved. The logistics are much smoother. They are capable of coordinating large-scale exercises. And of special concern is the heightened submarine activity in the North Atlantic. And it, that challenges our sea lines of communications because, and th this is critical because in a crisis, in a war, Denmark, Norway needs reinforcement from the United States. And if that reinforcement is blocked in the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap, we have a problem. So Russia is not 10 feet tall. N let's not make Russia into something it's not. We don't believe, the Norwegians don't believe that they're a military threat to our territorial integrity right now, but there has to be no doubt that Russia is the dominant factor for our defense planning, has always been. So that's the challenge. This book is about the response. How should we respond to that? What we suggest in the book is a unified approach in which Northern European countries strengthen cooperation among themselves, and strengthens the transatlantic bond at the same time as we have a constructive discussion and relationship with Russia. So the prerequisite for a stable and secure Northern Europe is an alliance that combines national and regional efforts with a strong transatlantic bond. So we must acknowledge the importance of the US commitment. Without the US 
commitment to NATO. There is no NATO. Um, but we should also be aware to explain to the Americans that the U.S. needs a Europe free, whole, and at peace. The, the, the Americans need prosperity and security in Europe as well. So in an attempt to download the book's message in one, in one slide, I suggest we go back to the classic ends, ways, means nexus uh, as a point of departure. The ends, we always have to start with the ends. What is our objective with Russia? What's our end state with Russia? It's not an easy question, but I would suggest to you that we would like to have a strategic partnership with, with Russia. We, will have a strategic, we would like to have a strategic partnership with peaceful, a peaceful and prosperous Russia. We wish the Russian people no harm. We don't want a desperate Russia, but we can't have this strategic partnership at any price. It requires that Moscow is aligned to our Western values, the one enshrined in the NATO Treaty of 1949, which is democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. Moscow must accept these uh, basic values for us to have a strategic partnership. So if that is the end state, that should also guide our strategy. And our strategy, we suggest, is, uh, is NATO in 3D, deterrence, defense, and dialogue. And this triad represents the alliance's long-standing strategy but it must be recalibrated and made modern to the current situation. This is not a replay of the Cold War. The challenge is to strengthen the first two in order to enable the third, something that NATO and its partners can only do if we approach NATO, uh, Russia from a position of strength. So NATO must consider deterrence in the context of today with a full spectrum of nuclear, conventional, cyber and, and hybrid dimensions. We must consider defense in terms of fighting jointly, combined with updated contingency plans, with a command and control structure that is fit for purpose, and an exercise and training regime that takes into account interoperability so that we can work together with other countries, readiness, responsiveness, resilience, and sustainability. And resilience is, is increasingly an important point for all of us. Um, the armed forces of NATO, Norway, Denmark, have to look inwards to its own society so that the defense sector can work closely with the commercial sector and other parts of society, what we call the total defense concept, at the same time that it, as it looks outwards to its partners and allies. So that's deterrence and defense, but it has to be interlinked with, with dialogue, the third D. And this book emphasizes that NATO must find a constructive dialogue with Moscow through bilateral and multilateral engagements to find a common ground for coexistence, but it has to be based on a rules-based international order. If, if it's the rule of the jungle, we, small states, lose. We depend on international law. Dialogue must be um, based on a series of confidence-building measures uh, we could start with arm, arms controls discussions, mutual inspections, and regimes for notification. So there's a range of diplomatic measures that can be taken with the objective of transparency and accountability. That's, that's the Norwegian policy in everything we do, transparency and accountability. So that leaves us with the means, and the means to empower NATO in 3D is burden sharing, with emphasis on the three Cs cash capabilities and contributions. To ensure continued U.S. leadership and commitment, uh, European uh, NATO members must increase their defense spending to 2% of the GDP. It's a discussion that we have in Norway. I'm sure you have it here. Um, it was agreed upon at the Wales Summit in 2014. It was reinforced in Warsaw in 2016 and again in Brussels this summer. We need to invest more in defense. You may say that 2% is not the whole story, uh, and of course it's not, but to Washington it says a great deal about your commitment to defense and security. And 20% of those 2% needs to be spent on, on capabilities. 
if all the budget goes to salaries and pensions, there isn't much for military equipment. And as you all know, in war, there is no second place. Uh, the second place, to be runners-up, is not a good place to be. So we need to invest in high-end capabilities to, to, to be able to outmatch any potential aggression. Um, and at the same time, we need to contribute elsewhere. We need to contribute uh, further south um, to deal with terrorism, to deal with human trafficking, migration, all these other things. And that's what we call NATO's burden-sharing scheme. And that's what we call NATO's 360-degree philosophy. We have to help each other everywhere, but we have to take extra responsibility for our part of the world. And for Norway, for Iceland, for Denmark, the northern flank is critical. So to conclude my opening, the combination of the three Ds and the three Cs uh, offers both political commitment and military force. It constitutes a comprehensive approach to establishing a theater-wide perspective on security in the north, where we look at the Baltic Sea and the Nor Norwegian Sea and the North um, Atlantic as one theater, where we look at Sweden and Finland as partners together with NATO. There is every reason to believe that if there's a crisis in the North, Sweden and Finland will work closely with NATO countries. So this model is a bit simplistic. It's, it's, it's my tweet. It's my, my attempt to do it in one slide. But all models are simplistic. Uh, but it does offer a unified approach to our security challenge. And this is uh, the way forward to strengthen our region. So if you look at the white paper, and especially the chapter on the Nordic countries, uh, this book has, has case studies on all the Nord northern group countries. So there's, there's one on the high north, there's one on the Nordic countries, one on the three Baltic countries, one on Poland, Germany, UK, and the Netherlands. And then there's North America in addition to that, and a NATO perspective. Uh, but what it suggests is that the Nordic countries are in an especially good position to, um, to contribute to peace and, and stability. We have relatively stable democratic political systems. We have relatively strong economies. We um, have positive relationships with each other. We do have extensive cooperation. We have a tradition to contribute to international operations. And many of us have punched considerably, considerably above our, our, um, our weight for a long time, especially in Afghanistan. So the northern countries have a special bond that enables us to work closely with North America. There is a special bond between the Nordic countries and, the, and North America. So despite different alliances, different defense profiles among the Nordic countries, there is a great opportunity to cooperate if we look at it from the prism of the wider North, where we look at North America and Northern Europe together with uh, the ocean between. So this is what I believe uh, is the way forward. This is what the authors of the book suggests. And uh, this is the main message uh, for, for my presentation today. And I'll be happy to discuss anything you would like to bring up, whether it relates to the book or Brexit or anything you would like to discuss. I'm happy to do that at the end of, of our presentations. For now, over to Per Erik. Now, um, to follow up, I will not uh, elaborate more on the book itself. I will, um, I've chosen to elaborate more about the topics uh, covered in uh, this book. Or as some would say, I'm, I'm actually trying to explain what Olsen was trying to say, <laughs> in a way. Uh, um, first of all, what, what actually is Northern Europe? Is, is that a homogeneous uh, area? Or is it is a very diverse area? Uh, I would argue for the latter. Uh, first of all, if you look at the, uh, the Nordic region where we are, uh, it consists of the five countries and all the uh, territories attached. But however, it's a very um, uh, special region in that sense that if you think about it, if you go from Denmark all the way up to Svalbard, Greenland, uh, the Nordic uh, area is actually the link between continental Europe and also the Arctic. And uh, the opposite, uh, if you look uh, west and east, uh, the, the Nordic area is also the link between the North Atlantic and the Baltic Sea region. Um, so um, in many ways, it's, 
easy to see how many trends, geopolitical trends, um, affects us in many ways. But if you go to a wider perspective and look at the whole northern European area, um, in, uh, I have to go back to the book in one sense, is that the, in Olsen argues in this book that you have within the northern European region that we have the divide between those states that are continental oriented and those states who are Atlantic ori oriented. For instance, if you go to um, um, uh, Germany, Poland, the Baltic states, Swe Sweden and Finland, uh, they, they are more concerned with uh, security in Eastern Europe and the Baltic Sea area. And you find very little um, in those countries about uh, security concerns in the North Atlantic area. Uh, in, um, in the United States, Canada, uh, Iceland, Norway, uh, uh, they uh, do participate in uh, operations in the Baltic area and contribute to the enhanced forward present operation in uh, that region. However, uh, those four states are uh, highly concerned with regarding the military challenges in the North Atlantic uh, area. Uh, the Netherlands and uh, Denmark are somewhat ambivalent. They are both participating quite heavily in uh, the uh, uh, operations in the Baltic uh, area, uh, but have some concerns about the uh, North Atlantic uh, situation. Uh, the, um, if you look at all the structures you have for security in the Northern European region, there are some that encompasses most or all countries. Uh, one is the Northern Group, that is used as a basis of selecting countries for this uh, book. Uh, that includes the Nordic Five, the Baltic Three, UK, Germany, the Netherlands and Poland. And also the, uh, and that's a British construct. Another bit British construct, the uh, Joint Expeditionary Force also includes most of the same um, northern European country. But then you have a variety of arrangements in our region that include some. Um, NATO is very predominant uh, in this region also. However, um, if, even if they're strongly attached to, they're not a part of NATO uh, regarding, uh, if you speak about Finland and Sweden. Uh, regarding EU, Iceland, Norway, and soon UK are not a part of the, United, or the European Union. Uh, and also Denmark is a special case because they have the opt-out regarding the military uh, participation in EU uh, arrangements. You have the uh, Nordic-Baltic uh, cooperation, very important for uh, consultations between ministers. And also the uh, Nordic defense cooperation with both uh, uh, policy consultations, armament uh, cooperation, and also defense uh, cooperation. In addition, there's a number of multilateral and bilateral arrangements that you find between uh, countries in Northern um, uh, Europe. Now, um, regarding security, uh, this book is about uh, war or defense, deterrence, and so forth, and, uh, and dialogue. Uh, but that's, in, if you look at the um, security in Northern Europe, uh, there's a wider scope than that. In 2015, um, there was a report presented to the Norwegian defense minister uh, regarding security. And Professor Rolf Tomnes, who led the uh, work, he presented this model to the, uh, the minister, and the, minister uh, and the minister of defense. Uh, and it depicts that um, war, of course, is the most demanding task for the armed forces. And we need to be prepared. We need to be able to deter. We need, need to be able to defend ourselves and deal with high intensity conflicts. Uh, however, uh, you also have some of the mo most difficult cases regarding security, those more ambiguous uh, cases, the, the um, severe crisis cases, and, uh, and also uh, societal security is something that you cannot look away from. Um, you have to be able to deal with uh, um, natural disasters, uh, requirements for search and rescue, um, etc. Now, um, and these are not mutually exclusive. So even if we have seen a, a discourse lately uh, in NATO and elsewhere that uh, uh, classic defense, classic war is more dominant on the arena, it, it doesn't rule out the others. You still have to hedge. You have to, you have to be able to deal with all types of cases to, um, to take care of security in uh, Northern Europe and elsewhere. 
Uh, for example, uh, regarding societal security, uh, the Arctic Council put in place this arrangement that also includes Northern Europe. Uh, it was a uh, deal to how the responsibilities for search and rescue are divided among uh, various uh, countries. And, and even if you've seen after 2014 and what happened in Ukraine that uh, the, the classic defense, uh, military defense is more uh, dominant still, uh, it's uh, the, the, all, all the societal security arrangements in the Arctic, for instance, and also on SAR, they are expanding still, and they're growing in parallel um, to this discourse. Uh, also, the, um, you have the difficult cases with the crisis and unconventional threats. And I mean, if you read a newspaper, uh, both here in Denmark, but elsewhere, um, uh, terrorism, cyber attacks, influence operations, hybrid warfare, um, considerations regarding weapons of mass destruction are cases that we also have to deal with. And the problem is that they're more um, unpredictable and complex than, than, than many other classic military scenarios. We also have a very blurred border between uh, peace and war. And they, in many ways, they're more difficult to, to manage crisis than, than you know, peacetime crisis or war itself because the, of the ambiguity. Now, this campaign started 10 years ago. And um, someone else copied uh, this uh, campaign lately by extract, uh, extracting three letters from this uh, slogan. Uh, but if you look at what happened in Russia uh, from um, 2008 and onwards, there has been a military buildup. The, the, the Russians are, uh, if you compare the Russians from 2008 in Georgia and today, they're, they're far more capable, uh, they're more modern. Uh, they have a logistic system that works, they have a mobility system that works. So, so anyways, uh, at least Putin has uh, been successful regarding making Russia a great military power again. And that has caused uh, some um, uh, concern. The, uh, as Olsen alluded to, the, uh, in Northern Europe, a major uh, concern regarding state security um, is the bastion defense. Because the, uh, the, the, the Russians, no, no matter how you look at it, you cannot uh, disregard that they have uh, 400 nuclear warheads on their submarines in that region. And it's very important for their secondary deterrence, or, or secondary um, strike ability for uh, and respond, uh, and, and part of their nuclear deterrence uh, system. On, uh, and these warheads are on the so-called Borei and Delta IV submarines. And, so, and, and that, in that region, uh, right next to Norway, they have 60% of their sea-based nuclear deterrent. Um, and also a huge system of um, conventional land, navy, and air forces that protects uh, these nuclear submarines uh, in the Barents Sea, where they have uh, their ambition is to establish control. And they also, uh, due to uh, attack submarines, to um, long-range uh, uh, bombers, and also uh, some surface vessels, they can establish denial in the North Atlantic. And perhaps so, some of the most con uh, concerning thing is that they can actually disrupt the sea lines of communication between Northern America and Europe. And in a war-type scenario, uh, that will be very serious for NATO and all of us. Uh, so uh, regarding um, deterrence and defense, this is a very important case. Uh, I've been, um, uh, as Dan mentioned, I've been defense attaché to the Denmark for the last three years, actually. And uh, here I see a lot of debate is about uh, security in, in uh, Greenland. And m most of it has to do with actually societal security, if you look at it uh, carefully. Uh, the, uh, the state security uh, challenge in uh, the north is very little addressed, actually, here in, uh, in Danish debates that I have seen or reports. Uh, but however, uh, even if there's a huge military arsenal right next to Norway, uh, we don't lose any sleep over it. And we are quite convinced that uh, Russia is not, uh, per definition, a military threat to Norway itself. If you, actually, if you look at the politics in the Arctic in the north, uh, cooperation is the dominant factor. Uh, it, it was, we had cooperation in place in the Cold War, after the Cold War, and also now after 2014. Uh, United States, Canada, Russia, the Nord Nordic four, uh, five countries, they cooperate in this uh, region. So it's very hard to imagine that some uh, military conflict would start uh, for some reason over a, a case that occurs in the north. Um, all the differences seem to be solved politically and diplomatically as the situation is right now. 
Uh, our concern is that if you have a deterioration between uh, Russia and the West somewhere else, uh, and if you have a spillover effect into our region and they activate this uh, system, uh, it will be uh, quite uh, troublesome for us and we need to be prepared. Uh, this was the book that uh, Olsen gave out at RUSI uh, last year. Uh, and also it's about, it's a very timely publication uh, uh, last spring. Because what, what happened last year, uh, and also a little bit perhaps in 2016, was that the NATO is refocusing on Europe, coming home, as some would argue. And uh, after years of crisis management and international operation, uh, the old traits of collective defense and turns are revived within uh, NATO. And also, very importantly, the maritime domain has uh, re-emerged re as an important uh, arena. After decades of uh, very land-heavy uh, oriented operations in NATO uh, internationally. You also see now more military activity in uh, Northern Europe uh, to strengthen the deterrence and defense. Uh, for instance, you see the um, extended forward presence of uh, deployments that Denmark also takes a part of <coughs> into the three Baltic states, but also to Poland. Uh, in Norway, you see uh, a continuous uh, presence of uh, a U.S. Uh, Marine Corps that has rotational forces in the area. Uh, every winter, uh, the, the British Marines and the Dutch Marines come to um, Norway to uh, conduct uh, winter warfare training. And also, uh, you see this large exercise like Trident Juncture that occurs right now with 60,000 persons involved in the uh, North Atlantic uh, region. However, uh, I'd like to point out that dialogue is still in place. Uh, arrangements that we have with the Russians, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the incident at sea agreement where we meet the Russians every year and discuss uh, episodes in international waters and international airspace between uh, when uh, Russian military meets our militaries. Uh, we have a still uh, safety valve arrangement uh, with them on that. We have a hotline between the Norwegian military headquarters and the Northern Fleet headquarters. Uh, we have a, a daily cooperation on, uh, uh, regarding Coast Guard, and, and the Russian Coast Guard, by the way, is run by the FSB. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, we cooperate on border guard uh, and, and many other areas, uh, especially related to societal uh, security. Uh, some nations argue that uh, we need to isolate Russia and we need to uh, uh, and punish them by isolating them. But uh, at least in Norway and some other countries, I think Denmark also agrees that it's very, it's very dangerous to isolate someone, especially if you have tensions, because uh, if you don't know your counterparts and if you don't have a dialogue, you can actually have unintended escalation uh, that occurs, an unnecessary escalation. So, um, and that's the, uh, the, uh, the title for the uh, last book. Deterrence and defense is important regarding state security, of course, but also dialogue in uh, many ways. So I'd like to conclude my presentation with uh, two takeaways. I think that, uh, first of all, even if the, the military defense war is more predominant now uh, than, let's say, five, ten years ago, uh, hedging is still required. You need to be able to, to deal with both uh, uh, societal security, crisis response, and state uh, security at the same time. And also for uh, uh, state security in our region, uh, we need to have a more uh, holistic regional approach as argued in this book. It, it, you, you cannot separate the Baltic region and the North Atlantic region. Uh, it's viewed as one theater war by the Russians and we should also do the same. So thank you for those remarks. All right, well, I don't have slides for you, um, but I will give you sort of in connection to what was said uh, before I will talk to you about the Danish perspective on these whole things, because um, sort of what we've heard so far is sort of more the overarching, the regional um, perspective on it. And as you will see, Denmark agrees with a lot of things, but the, there's also some sort of specific uh, focus on, on a couple of challenges that the whole region actually faces, but where Denmark sort of is, is particularly worried about, I think, due to um, the nature of being a very small state, having very limited military capabilities um, and all these issues. So like the other countries, um, talking about sort of the threat perception for the region, um, for Denmark, it's quite obvious that sort of the, the threat perception changed um, with the Russian annexation of Crimea. I mean, as was said before, this was really the big eye opener 
even though um, you know, sort of the change in Russian attitude, I also agree with that that should have been visible um, earlier than 2014, but 2014 was, at least when you ask the politicians um, and the civil servants, was sort of the, the eye-opening moment. Um, and if you look um, at sort of how Denmark looks at Russia, it's quite clear that they're worried um, about Russia's vulnerability to use their military means for some kind of strategic goal they have, possibly in the Baltic Sea region or the North Atlantic. And for Denmark, that creates substantial insecurity for the entire region. Um, you can see that quite clearly when you look at the new Danish defense agreement that was uh, agreed upon on January 28th this year, where um, it's quite obvious that sort of the politicians consider the security situation in Denmark and the whole region to be sort of the most severe since the end of the Cold War. And they highlight four different issues, and some of them are actually interconnected. And the first one is, of course, a challenging and assertive Russia to the east. Um, and you can clearly see sort of this new focus on Russia in, in the defense agreement, where um, a lot of the space is actually taken up by Russia. The second uh, focus in the defense agreement is, of course, the continued instability in the Middle East and North Africa, and that links to the migration flows, the threat of terrorist attacks also in Europe. Um, that's not per se new. Um, that's sort of a continued threat assessment of what's been going on the last, let's say, 15, good 15 years, right, since 9-11. Since um, at the same time, then the third aspect is uh, climate change, but also heightened activities in the Arctic, where Denmark fears that Russia, but also other things that are going on in terms of opening shipping routes and all these things might actually influence Danish interests in the Arctic, which they of course have due to Greenland. Um, and the fourth part of this threat assessment that's in the Danish defense agreement is uh, cyberspace threats. And that focuses mainly on disinformation campaigns, fake news, um, influence campaigns. And here again, it ties back to Russia, basically, and, and the abilities that Russia has to influence European elections, sort of what they did um, with the US, right? There's sort of fear that that will happen in Europe as well. Um, hacking of parties, hacking of sensitive information, these type of things. Um, so when we take this threat assessment for the region, again, it's quite obvious that most of the countries share this assessment. But as has been said, Denmark, um, in the sense for the region has a foot in both camps, right? So there's a lot of focus on the Baltic Sea region, the threat to the Baltic states by Russia. But due to Greenland, there should be focus um, on this North Atlantic area as well. And I actually agree with what Pierre-Éric Soli just said, that there's considering in the, the discussion in policy circles at least, there's surprisingly little attention paid to that aspect so far. So, so far, um, the focus has been more the Baltic Sea region. Um, and I agree that it's important to actually look at this as a whole uh, thing, because being able to deal with the crisis in the Baltic Sea region, if they then, if Russia then theoretically would come through the North Atlantic, doesn't do you any good. Um, so the focus for the region lies on preserving, for Denmark, lies on preserving um, free navigation for the region and keeping the region as low tension as possible. Um, and there are two main threats that Russia poses for this, and that's the aggressive posturing that we've seen, the exercises that have, they've been conducting um, with short warning, without warning, disrupting shipping, potentially disrupting communications, these things. Um, and on the other hand, of course, as was also already talked about, the anti-access area denial capabilities that Russia has with the bastion, um, but also in the Baltic Sea region with the Iskander missiles, for example, that are stationed at uh, Kaliningrad, that actually block um, access to the Baltic Sea region. And that's, of course, important because Denmark is one of the main access points for the Baltic Sea. So it makes sense that Denmark has increased focus on these area denial capabilities. So having said that, if, when it comes to Denmark's assessment of Russia as a threat, um, Russia isn't as such considered a direct territorial threat to Denmark. Um, Denmark does consider, however, Russia a territorial threat to the Baltic states. And because they're NATO members and because of the sort of coherence of the region, 
um, the defense minister came out with this uh, very sort of key statement saying that Denmark's security starts in the Baltics because of exactly this, right? Um, for Denmark, what they're more worried about is this sort of, um, as Perik has called, the uh, severe crisis type of scenario. So the hybrid warfare, the uh, cyber attacks, these type of things. Um, when we look at what Denmark then can do about this, it is quite clear, as has been mentioned before, that there's a lot of cooperation going on already in Northern Europe, in the Nordic states. And NATO is the most important bit for Danish security and defense policy. So that's the cornerstone. Um, and strategic partners are the US, the UK, and France, because of based on sort of their more traditional military active roles. Um, however, as was also mentioned already, the opt out of the European Union regarding defense and security cooperation is quite important here. And I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, we also have Nordefco, the Nordic defense cooperation between Sweden, Finland, Norway, Iceland, and Denmark. Um, and that's been a nice venue for cooperation, but there has been a lot of criticism going on that Denmark maybe wasn't as engaged as they could have been in the cooperation, that they didn't take it as serious. And that's connected to sort of the Danish criticism of it being nice for cooperation, but being also a complicated forum because you have Finland and Sweden that are not NATO members, you have Norway and Iceland that are not EU members, um, and you have a lack of large countries with sort of strong military capabilities. That's at least what the Danish politicians have told me when I've interviewed them. Um, that being said, the change security perception of uh, the, the region actually made sort of an a increased interest in Nordefco cooperation. Um, visible, and I think that sort of there's more focus being directed towards that now. Um, at the same time, I mean, Denmark has been very active in contributing to security in the region. So they contribute to the uh, British-led enhanced forward presence in Estonia, for example. I think about 200 troops um, contribute to NATO's Baltic air policing, the German-led framework nation concept in Poland. Um, and the Standing NATO Mar Maritime Group 1. So there's a lot of things going on where Denmark actually has forces involved. And there's a lot of um, high-level diplomatic talks also going on in different forums. We have, as was mentioned, the Nordic group, right, uh, the Northern group. You have a German-Nordic uh, Baltic forum. You have a Baltic Commanders Conference, all these things. Um, and while these are all venues for great cooperation um, and dialogue, there's a bit of a questioning, um, at least from Danish levels, in how far this really, really helps with security. I mean, it puts people together in the same room, brings them talking, but it seems like there's some kind of lack of, of actual progress, of outcomes of these uh, fora. And I'm willing to discuss that, of course, if uh, you disagree with me. But that's been my impression of, of the assessment of it. Um, so it's a limited view of what they can achieve. So given all that, what then are the problems, right? What are the challenges for the region, for Denmark, Denmark security in the region? Um, and there's the perception quite clear that Trump is one of these challenges. And that's, of course, because he's questioned the commitment to NATO. And for a state like Denmark, that has limited military capabilities themselves and that builds its entire uh, security and defense policy on NATO, that's threatening and that's scary. And even though sort of under what Trump says, if you look at what's actually going on, there's no signs of uh, the US withdrawing from NATO or anything. But of course, the politicians and the civil servants are, need to react to that um, and have been worried about this. Um, just because, yeah, the U.S. commitment and the US, ca U.S. capabilities are crucial for security in the Baltic Sea region and in the North Atlantic. Um, other things that worry Denmark are, of course, Brexit, because Britain is um, one of the main strategic partners of Denmark, and nobody knows how Brexit will actually affect Britain, Britain's military capabilities, Britain's economic capabilities, and the relation to the European states or the EU member states, I should say. Um, so there's, that also creates a lot of insecurity regarding future military cooperation um, support from that side. And then the third aspect 
that is sort of an external change that worries Denmark and that has an impact on how Denmark looks at the security threat in, or the, the security situation in the region is uh, the development of PESCO, the Permanent Structure Cooperation and Security and Defense in Europe, um, because of the opt-out, right? So even though they can sort of circumvent the opt-out by being part of industrial cooperation type of things, because then it wouldn't be defense cooperation but fall under, under industry matters, um, sort of the question of how European EU defense develops is a, a very interesting matter for Denmark. And of course, they're trying to keep close tabs on where the development is going, right? Um, there's also focus on, as was mentioned, the resilience of Danish society itself. So instead of only sort of looking at developments and yeah, what, outside of Denmark and what happens in the wide world, there's also looking inward regards to society and how you can strengthen society against disinformation campaigns, against fake news. Um, I don't think they've found the right recipe quite yet, but there's a lot of sort of strategizing going on um, about that. And there's a clear, a clear challenge, but also clear focus in terms of what has to happen. Um, if you now look at all these challenges, um, what then can be done to overcome them? And there Denmark agrees very much with what has been said in terms of how to deal with Russia. And that's this combination of deterrence, defense, and dialogue, right? And dialogue is very, very important for Denmark. Um, so together with this need due to Trump, due to Brexit, due to PESCO, um, with this need to actually have stable and reliable partners in your security cooperation, um, there's some talk going on about strengthening cooperation with Germany, which I think would make a lot of sense, at least considering the region. Um, sort of traditionally, there has not been a lot of strong military cooperation between Denmark and Germany because of the very different military outlooks, right? Where Denmark has led military activism as, as foreign policy, um, Germany has been very passive with their use of military, focusing on nation building tasks, focusing on um, support, sort of very no active military engagement if they can avoid it, due to, of course, history and the German sort of societal relationship um, with their military. But Germany also due to the change security uh, situation is becoming more and more active and that actually opens up a possibility for further cooperation with Denmark um, because they have a lot of the same interests. They have a similar sort of access, similar focus on the Baltic Sea region at least, um, the North Atlantic as well due to its importance. Um, they have a lot of already ongoing maritime cooperation and the maritime domain has become the new focus, right? As has been said before. So there's a lot of po potential for, for deepening that cooperation, for moving that further. Um, while at the same time, of course, Germany is already very important in all aspects of Danish policy because it is the great power neighbor, right? Um, so it matters what Germany says, it matters what Germany does already, so why not? expand that more also towards military cooperation. And lastly, they have an interest in developing, at least possibly developing the same military capabilities when it comes to the defense of land forces, for example, when it comes to cyber capabilities, defense against cyber attacks, um, these type of measures. There's a lot of overlap there. So I would end um, my sort of tour de force through Denmark's perception of the threat uh, in the region and what to do about it um, with a call for thinking about Germany a little bit more than is done so far in Danish uh, defense circles. Thank you.